So I'm here today with Gil Headley, who is perhaps my favorite anatomist on the planet, and I study a lot of anatomy. And I was inspired by Gil's work many years ago and had the good fortune to spend a few days with him studying and at the Florida School of Massage, my alma mater, when I went for some continuing education probably over a decade ago. Um, and then also when he came around Asheville at the time of the beautiful um, uh, solar eclipse mm -hmm. and um, got to hear some of his um, updated work that he was doing. Um, Gil comes to us. Where are you these days, Gil? Where are you living? I'm in, uh, I'm up the canyon, up Ute Pass from Colorado Springs and Cascade in the mountains. Oh, wonder, uh, wonderful. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful. Um, so Gil, I, I have always loved his approach to anatomy because his anatomy is really based in wholeness, looking at the human as a whole being and that there's this mystical element to us. There's there's some magic in the human form. And so not an anatomist who reduces everything to parts and mecha mechanics, but also really having um, extraordinary reverence for humans. And it seems that um, that reverence um, began early in Gil's life and in early in his um, adult learning career. He was a student at the Divinity School at the University of Chicago, and at the same time um, became a rolfer. So he was deep in the fascia and in the physical form, but then also in this soul spirit journey at the same time. And then he spent five years studying psychodynamics and energy healing at a mystery school. And that really seems to have tied all of those parts together. Um, he developed what he calls integral anatomy, which is a great um, name for the work that Gill does, um, integrating all of the parts into this understanding or this exploration, really, of humans as whole beings. And he leads uh, hands-on human dissection workshops, which so amazing. Um, and he he calls us, those, those of us that study with him and his work, that we are somanauts, that we are kind of like these astronauts of the body. And he's published many books um, and a wonderful anatomy series called the Integral Anatomy Series, um, going through hundreds of hours of dissection videos. And at each stage, always bringing that extraordinary reverence and appreciation to the human that donated their body and this magnificent human form. So he's working on a project right now, Anatomy A to Z. I'm a member of his site, gilheadley.com, where you can watch all these wonderful live talks as they come. Gil brings in um, special guests that he um, works with, um, T.S. Lee Little, um, his uh, sweet partner, Rachel. They just did a talk on Sunday um, about self-regulation and the nervous system. Uh, Jill Miller, all these wonderful um, people, just different perspectives on the human body. So truly an honor to be here with you, Gil. Thank you for, for taking time out of your busy schedule to to be here with us. You're welcome. That was an amazing introduction. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I first learned about you through a talk that you gave that kind of propelled you into fame in the bodywork world. And it was a, a talk called The Fuzz. And you were talking about this, this fuzz. And then when the last time that I saw you live in person here in Asheville, you were kind of going on a tour saying, hey, I've got some updated information about what that fuzz actually is. So I'm wondering if you could give us a, a, an idea about maybe what you thought it was, but now what you believe it to be. Well, any of us who've studied from a book <laughs> or learned in a classroom have seen some pretty pristine images of the human body mm -hmm. drawn as discrete parts. And when I went into the lab and started dissecting, there was a lot more material than ever made it into the drawing, which I understand an artist is trying to illustrate one thing, they have to not draw another thing. But nature has drawn us differently. Mm -hmm. And in truth, our body is uh, a continuous form 
of that differentiated embryo that's still differentiating as we speak. And so there's no place in the body that's separated or disconnected. Mm -hmm. And when I began to differentiate the tissues in the lab, I, I, I became a witness of those continuities. But I didn't really, I couldn't translate them immediately. They were mysteries to me, this fuzzy connections between uh, between one muscle fascicula and another that in a picture are drawn so discreetly. And so at first I did think that there were they were adhesion, that was an aberrant adhesion, and that as if the body should like, uh, as if the, the Iderop talked about the muscles slipping over one another like silk stockings. And I don't think she was inaccurate. I think what I took from it, though, was that the silk stocking, there's one here and there's one here, and they're two different things when in fact the relationship between the muscle tissues is a silky one. And I was dissecting the silk mm. be between uh, say rectus femoris and vastus intermedius, there's a membrane there. And, and it's, a, it's continuous from that, those muscle fibers to their more dense fascial wrappings from one dense fascial wrapping to another dense fascial wrapping. There's actually a continuous fascial structure. Uh, it's fascia relating fascia to fascia, but each fascia is having a different texture and a different function and movement and a different a different um, organization of the collagen fibers in it. And so when I was taking the tissues apart and witnessing that fuzzy intermediary zone between the named structures, yeah, I did first think maybe, maybe that's uh, stuck and it's not supposed to be, but after I learned, by the time I filmed that fuzz, fuzz speech, I had long understood that this was, that this belonged there. <laughs> and I had already started to call it filmy fascia. And when I filmed that little speech, that was the last time I ever gave it because my, my even at that moment, my, my uh, understanding had shifted from perceiving the fuzz as something maybe aberrant. You know, I had come to realize, oh no, that's filmy fascia, I called it. So I called it filmy fascia for another 13 years or so, because it was a nice textural word to describe this, mm -hmm. this slippery membrane that was connecting everything. And that was really the anatomy of movement. But when I knew I was going to launch on that tour that you mentioned, I stopped by Asheville with, I, I needed a new word at that point. So I went from fuzz to filmy fascia, and then I went from filmy fascia to what I call perifascia. And perifascia is the one I run with now and the one that I hope people will pick up on because it's very, it's, it's a nice anatomy word, it's descriptive, and it, it can get into the head of an anatomy teacher as well as a textural aficionado, like a body worker. So film, uh, film, uh, you know, perifascia is that filmy fascia, that, that fuzzy intermediary fascia that lives between other fascia, but that also surrounds them and in which they are embedded, and that's the key. The deep fascia is embedded in perifascia. It's not merely neighbor to it, but I like the analogy of um, spaghetti in jello. So if you made a, a jello mold with a spaghetti grid inside of it, the jello would interpenetrate each little pathway between the spaghettis and it would and it would suspend the spaghettis and you could cut away some of it from the spaghetti and get down to the spaghetti and you see the spaghetti texture show up after you cut away the top layer of jello and then and then you could cut the spaghetti out of the jello and then you'd have a texture and then you could see there oh there's more jello underneath it so perifascia is very much like that it's a it's a membranous substance in which the dense fibrous fascia are embedded and then that makes it slippery on either side of that tissue mm -hmm. so that the deep fascia being anchored mm -hmm. to bone right and continuous with it and a relatively stable exoskeleton can have um have its its state movement stability providing function, while the perifascia can provide um, the the connection and the interface, which allows for play with other tissues in relationship to the deep fascia. So if you have, you know, muscle tissue in relationship to deep, to deep fascia, 
where it moves, it's moving as a function of the intervening perifascia or superficial fascia, the fatty layer over the deep fascia, where it's moving, it's moving as a function of perifascia in relationship to it. So it's distensible. So the fuzz is is distensible. It's, its organization allows it to move in many directions and it's, and it's hyper fluidity allows it to be both a, a conductor and a conduit and a pathway for um, microbiome for mm -hmm. cancer cells, for that matter, or or for for uh, for healthy healthy movement of of um, of metabolites or what have you that are that are floating through our bodies, and uh, and allowing them to to function. Um, so whew, that was a big answer to a good. That's question. That's a great answer. Yeah, that's a great answer. Thank you. So I'm I'm thinking about um, that perifascia and it's very liquid. So it has uh, a lot of water in it, yeah. and so that I call speaks it super hydrated. Yeah, super hydrated. Yeah. And um, so a couple things came up for me while you were giving that first, the jello piece, the spaghetti and jello, mm -hmm. and then also the ability to move as a function of this perifascia and whether or not it has enough hydration in it is where I'm going with this. So, so that is this where we can get into trouble when we become systemically hydrate dehydrated, that, that, that. Um, aqueous, super, super liquid area then gets sticky. What happens when we get dehydrated? Um, yeah, sticky is a good word. And, and yet we have to think not in terms of like Elmer's glue here, although Elmer's glue is basically liquid fascia, um, <laughs> right? It's, a, it's boiled, it's boiled horse hooves. Um, right along with uh, uh, marshmallows as well. Uh, all the delicious, don't eat the glue, eat the marshmallow. But um, <laughs> we, we, we have to talk in terms of degrees. So I do talk about the, the perifascial system as a, as a water reservoir. It is a water reservoir in our body, but drinking a bunch of water isn't gonna hydrate you necessarily. You, your tissue has to call for the water. So our, our use of our bodies calls calls the water to the place. If if we sort of sip our water and move, we're more likely to integrate that water into our body than if we guzzle our water and sit. Um, so, and then that being said, so let's say you're chronically dehydrated, which a lot of people are. Say you move to Colorado and live at eight thousand feet and don't <laughs> and don't drink water. Um, you're you're going to be chronically dehydrated. So your digestive processes, which require about two gallons of fluid a day, if you're still eating and not just drying up and starving to death, if you're still eating, you're going to be your your body is going to be making use of water. And where's it going to get it from? It's going to get it from the body's reservoirs, right? Mm -hmm. And those reservoirs are our, our tissues. And so it's not so much a question of like my tissues are dry and stuck to each other necessarily, but it's more what if, what if you're down two percent? You know, what if you're what if you're down two two you're you're dehydrated two percent? How's that going to affect um, the conductivity of the tissues? It'll be slightly diminished. Well, you'll be sort of operating in a little bit of a cloud. You know, it's it's not necessarily like you've turned into a block of wood. You know, but it, you know, if if you're a little bit de dehydrated, like how 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 I don't know. I'm not a physiologist, but I, sure. I'm curious to know, like how does you know the, these these perifascial tissues are full of are of nerves. You know, they're wrapping around every every blood vessel, every every uh, nerve sleeve. They're they're it's it's a, a ubiquitous type of tissue in our body that I feel has been o o generally overlooked, and yet if this is a, a conductivity pathway um, for, our, for our body. So if we're just sort of lowering our conductivity, we're lowering our, that transfer of energy in our body and our capacity to transfer energy and our, possible, our, our capacity to do work with it. Mm -hmm. or, or we're creating drag, right? If, there's, if, there's, if, there's, if you're not in the ideal state of slipperiness, then you're moving into the direction of drag in your, in your movement function. So if there's more drag in the system and less slipperiness, it's going to be more tiring to do things, you know, as a, as a, at some percentage and some degree, you'll be, you'll be um, devoting energy to overcoming drag in your system 
when you could be uh, not wasting your energy there and using it to become enlightened instead. That would be nice instead. Of, I'm certainly not advising it. You watch the news with your spare energy. But so, so, so there's, um, it's kind of like that, you know, yeah, you're moving from slippery to gummy. You can move from gummy to crystalline even. That's what I didn't mm -hmm. mention in that talk. And, and actually the, the Maillard effect happens, you know, literally in our bodies where, where the tissues are slow cooking in a, in a sense. And, you know, if you, you ever, you know, slow cooking, right? You put it in a crock pot or whatever. Well, sure. if things are sort of heated up a little bit slowly over a long period of time, you will have a happy, <laughs> a, a happy melting, melting pot of your tissues uh, in which their flavor will improve, but their mobility will decrease. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. because the crystal is, crystals forming in your tendons, for instance, uh, or, or in your fascial sleeves in general, is going to create kind of a, a brittleness that's harder to overcome than gumminess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's it seems like the perifascia, a couple things. One is that similar to uh, synovial membranes in the joints, which require you know which you know our my understanding is that the synovial membranes in the in the movable joints will create a little bit of synovial fluid even when you're at rest but movement puts demand on that synovial membrane to like flood the joint with fluid with that synovial fluid to protect the joint and do all its things so it seems like perifascia is similar in that the movement of your body then keeps things flowing, puts some demand on the system to keep keep water, keep fluids flowing. And then through that per perifascia, um, so that the so that the perifascia is a channel of all things, really, a channel of communication, a channel of chemistry, a channel of movement, a channel of um, perhaps gaseous exchange and basically communication between your systems. Um, perhaps um, maybe there's some tissues of repair that come through. I don't know if fibroblasts move through perifascia, but that's it, through those fluids, you know, so that repair can happen. So it seems essential. And what you're saying is that it's essential that it stays hydrated. It's essential and that even just a little bit of dehydration can limit our body's capacity for the systems to communicate with each other um, and to limit our movement ultimately as well. And then that uh, becomes a negative feedback group, loop, right? Then our movement is limited. And so then we don't move as much. And so then the tissue becomes more dehydrated and then we end up spiraling. And then somewhere along the way, sounds like my, my, where I go to is that perhaps then pain comes into, to the situation because, my experience is when we don't move enough, we're definitely going to, um, our experience of pain in our bodies is going to increase. Um, so, so um, I yeah, have to toss you... in that you can be dehydrated and still have fluidity in your tissues. Mm. Okay. The movement is more important than the fluid to keep yes. what you have fluid. I'm not advising being dehydrated, but if we look at the bush people of the Kalahari Desert, uh, who were studied extensively and numerous books were written about them, they were chronically dehydrated. They, they literally mm -hmm. would get like a drop of water off of a leaf in the morning and they'd be mm -hmm. wringing out the intestines of an elon that they killed to get some juice out of it. Mm -hmm. And yet they walked 80 miles to get the elon. So so th they were they were a people who were chronically <laughs> dehydrated living in that desert and yet mm -hmm. they still had great fluidity of movement i don't advise their lifestyle and they didn't have a high life expectancy uh you know i don't advise it not because it's not really cool i would be inspired by <laughs> about the bushman of the calhari uh, but but um it was it's a hard life i mean yeah. you know their coat they would literally pack mud on their skin to keep from freezing to death in the winter because it gets pretty cold in kalahari in the winter mm -hmm. and they would just cuddle up in a pile and it would take them and and they wore like a mud coat um so mm -hmm. anyway hard life but uh they you know they were chronically dehydrated but also fluid movers mm -hmm. so i'm just i'm just tossing that in there as like a little caveat or something yeah you know? so 
yes, good to drink water. And if you're not moving, your body isn't going to use it. So you're just going to pee it out. Essentially, your your body isn't going to put it to use because the movement is what creates the demand in the tissue for to hydrate all your areas. And yeah. that perifascia is everywhere around every organ, around every nerve, around every everything. Correct. And if you have consistent movement, in other words, if you use your body, mm -hmm. uh, it's like... Uh, it's the, the greasy wheel gets the, gets the oil. In other words, it's, it's gonna, it's gonna, you're gonna keep the, di the di differential movement boils down all the way to the, to the, you know, to the muscle, individual muscle fibers moving relative to each other. You know, when this one is contracting and this one is not, one is on and one is off. That's a functional unit, the motor units, right? So mm -hmm. you can have relationships of, of cells that are moving relative to each other. And that's a perifascial interface too. I wouldn't call it perifascia mm -hmm. at that level because I can't dissect it. And if I can't mm -hmm. dissect it into a sheet, we don't call it a fascia. And so we change names in the, in the anatomy world, but the, the general pattern, it, it remains the same. One thing relative to another thing that's moving has to have either a pure fluid interface or a fluidy fascial interface. Mm -hmm. So in the musculoskeletal tissues, we have this fluidy fascial interface called perifascia. And in, in the viscera, we have serous fluid, right? So, or in the, or in the synovial joints, we have synovial Synovial fluid. So, so we can have differential movement of bones via synovial fluid, uh, or we can have differential movement of the stomach relative to the spleen or the or the liver via serous fluid. But if we're talking about muscle fibers relative to each other or muscle fasciculi relative to each other or muscle fasciculi relative to a plantar aponeurosis or if we, or um, or even muscle tissue relative to bone, there can be perifascia. Mm -hmm. Bone muscle isn't always rooting into the bone. Sometimes it's gliding over the bone mm -hmm. uh, or shearing, I would rather say. But mm -hmm. so, so we, yeah. <laughs> and so, and then hopefully there's enough fluid in a bursa sac to protect the the tendon or whatever from, from shearing <laughs> over that bone. Um, but so, so then um, for, for folks who, you know, so many people are working from home, sit at a desk. Um, mm -hmm. I recommend my clients, you know, get up every 30 minutes, 40 minutes or so, and just do a couple of minutes of movement to let that be um, that that's essential. I feel Um Really, do you have a, a recommendation for how often a person should get up and move and what should those do? Is there a recommendation about what that movement would be? Just like move through your range of motion. You're often doing this while you're teaching, by the way, which I'm I do all the time. I, <laughs> yeah. if, you, if you saw me when I was uh, like seven years old out in the peewee baseball field, I was the kid out in right field going like this. So they, they there's that special they, kid skill. Yeah, I was that, I was that <laughs> special kid. I'm still that special kid. And I was doing this. And I was doing, yeah. So um probably my recommendation would be move before you feel like it. Mm -hmm. Because most of us will get lost in our work. I do. And mm -hmm. and I don't want to move. I want to work. I'm doing my work. I got to hundreds of hours of footage to edit here and it's no one else is doing it so i have to move before i really want to move you know mm -hmm. so i try and i'm distractible anyway so i get i get up and, mm -hmm. and do things but you can also move in your in your seat too you know yeah. you, you change change your position do something and you, you'll do it automatically at some level but yeah. not enough mm -hmm. to stop cooking your ass in your chair because you literally <laughs> cooking your ass you know you it's you and so you know infl inflammation like you if you're sitting on something you're warming it up you're 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 mm. you're, you're, you're heating it so stasis mm. uh and and inflammation and dehydration kind of go together um so you you know <laughs> yeah makes yeah. me want to wiggle a little more yeah before, <laughs> yeah i would say bef yeah somehow you have to find a way to cue yourself to move before before you really are asked before your body starts yelling at you to move don't wait for your body to yell at you to move you can no. set a little alarm my son does right. this he's a he's a uh animator artist he sits at a computer 
all day long. And so mm-hmm. he has an alarm on his phone and it's like, mm-hmm. okay, 15 minutes, stand up, you know, yeah. whatever. I don't know what he sets it for, but not two hours mm-hmm. stand up, you know, 15 right. minutes, 20 minutes, you know, a few times an hour, just like, well, whatever, just, you know, just give it a little, whatever. I'll get, <laughs> get it going. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and assuming moving more parts of the body is beneficial, like just getting up and doing kind of a couple of leg stretches isn't really going to hydrate the areas of your neck and shoulders. If so, better to move the whole, yeah, all the parts. Do nice right? un- unsociable movements because <laughs> our sociable movements are a straight jacket, literally. Yeah. Um, we, we literally move around through our culture, through our work environments, through our social environments, through our family environments, according to the strictures of movement permitted, permitted in those environments. You know, no one's, no one's moonwalking through the office, right? It's not allowed there, whatever. So our, our culture limits our movement uh, tremendously. The cultures in which, in which we move are limiting, are limiting our, our movement, and we have to break out of that too. Uh, not only our, our seated posture in front of our computer, but our polite posture in front of our coworkers. Sure, so sure. whatever, go to the bathroom stall and 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 do what you got to do. If it, you know, it, uh, but the thing is, we have to move outside of all all of the limit cycles on our movement, which is why I'm kind of a random wiggler. <laughs> which I which I love. And whenever I'm teaching, I always give my I tell my students, feel free to roam about the cabin. Don't sit in your seat, get up. Here's a ball, roll your butt on the wall while I'm talking, oh. like move, stretch, keep moving cuz it keeps their brains alert also, you know. Yes. Um, Good job. Because <laughs> I'm that person in the back of the class <laughs> doing oh, yeah. that too. I am <laughs> also you see me in the back of the fascia congress. I'm the I'm like well, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> totally, <laughs> totally. Um, so so another thing that I would like to um to check in about is you know there's a lot of people doing self myofascial release and using balls and foam rollers and stuff which i'm a huge fan of i get real specific in trigger points and do self trigger point release but i also tend to use softer balls than most folks because the hard balls seem kind of shocking um and i and i agree with you you can't you can't throw the nervous system out the window when you're working with the muscles and stuff if someone's going Ooh, that's not helping their muscles to relax and soften. Um, so you have to kind of enter through the gate of the nervous system. And, and my my philosophy is using softer things. But can you speak a little bit to what are we doing when we're doing self myofascial release? Or do you have a sense of like, can we literally break up adhesions in our tissue? Or are we just hydrating? Like what's going on? I definitely steer folks away from metaphors of breaking up or mm-hmm. blasting or or tearing or de-adhering even like all those mm-hmm. all those violences um uh I steer away from that kind of language because whatever a person might mean by it what most folks will take away from it is do this hard and fast or mm-hmm. in, in a way that really, really tells this tissue what for. And mm-hmm. uh, you'll never get anywhere with a horse doing that. You'll never get anywhere mm-hmm. with a, a dog or a cat doing that. I mean, yeah, people beat their horses and dogs into submission for centuries. But uh, the people who are really good at it were horse whisperers and dog whisperers, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. So our, our body responds very nicely to to whisp to whispers um i find uh, i've never been a person who has easily endured uh kind of blasty kind of work um especially mm-hmm. folks who are hypermobile will be damaged totally. way, way quicker totally. than your average uh, than your average joe uh from from that kind of work and other people will be like, oh, I love that kind of work. I want to kind of really get in there. And it's like, you know, mm-hmm. something that's actually pretty superficial. You can't really get in there because your tissues will mm-hmm. defend. And mm-hmm. all you're overcoming is the defense that you're presenting. So if you like to arm wrestle and lose, then that's a mm-hmm. kind of work. 
and that's that's and some people that's the dance they like to do they they go to a body worker who's a big strong person who's going to overcome their system and they defend as much as they can and then they they lose and they and they relax uh to that and that's a that's an odd little dance and some call it you know bdsm <laughs> you know what i'm saying right. <laughs> It's right. like uh, that's right. fine. Dominance of submission is a is a sport that some folks enjoy, but it's not necessarily what uh, your tissues need. It might be what your mind is calling for, but it's not necessarily what your tissues need. Uh, your conscious mind versus your subconscious mind, and and the um, and so I I think soft 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 is nice, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and diggy is curious to me mm -hmm. as, as an approach uh for those reasons uh so i like jill's work jill miller mm -hmm. Sue Hitzman, um uh, folks who 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 uh are kind kind yeah. to the issues they're not about mm -hmm. mashing them uh it's more about connecting and mm -hmm. feeling through and hydrating so uh, the story was told in the Rolf Institute when I was a student there in the early 90s um, about the thixotropic effect. And the idea was that as you kind of leaned into the tissues, and they were talking specifically about deep fascia, there was no thought of hairy fascia. The idea was that you would add enough pressure um, and that the the tissue would melt essentially at, at as a thixotropic effect. It would change from a, a gel and go into solution. So the gel sol transition is what the thixotropic effect is about. And the idea was that you could manually induce the a transition from gel to sol. And when you went to solution, then you were free to mold and remold the tissues into places perhaps more appropriate for that person's structure. That was the guiding metaphor that we used. And it, that when you use that metaphor, you end up with a lot of hard work, you know, on the part of the practitioner who's wearing out their body, trying to induce the thixotropic effect in the deep fascia and a lot of hard work for the client because they have to endure that diggy diggy. So as I, did all my anatomy studies for a long time and came uh, to have an appreciation for this, this uh, perifascia in which that deep fascia was embedded that I don't remember ever hearing about in my training because I don't think anyone knew about it because it wasn't drawn. And if you didn't do dissection, think about it for 30 years, you weren't going to come up with a story about it that mm -hmm. might be helpful. So the story for me changed like what what is happening when you lean onto tissues whether with a, a ball or a roller or an elbow uh for that matter or whether you're just leaning up against the stair rail and you're <laughs> whatever you know uh whatever it is that you're using as a tool or or a movement technique or something i think the the deep fascia is not for one thing, I mean, Robert Schleip in, in my Rolfing training, to his credit, brought through the thixotropic effect story into question, saying, you know, that if you if you were to uh, induce the thixotropic effect in the deep fascia, it would require the pressure basically of an elephant standing on you. Mm. And um, he was like, I don't think we're doing that. You know, I don't think we could even we could produce enough pressure manually to do that. Tom Finley, who was a good friend of, of another Rolfer and a good friend of Robert's and a scientist as well, um, said, well, maybe we could if we do it at an angle and we're shearing, and then maybe we could produce the thixotropic effect on the deep fascia. And I'm like, fellas, let's stop talking about the deep fascia. Let's talk about the perifascia where you actually can induce the thixotropic effect without much pressure because it's it's a... It's it's the true gel in the story that can be put into solution. And so what I realized was when I was leaning on someone with my elbow, which I did a lot of, I'm gonna get my elbow in here, you know, and and I'm I'm leaning there. I wasn't a rolfer for very long, actually, a couple of years, but I'm like, okay, I'm here, I'm connected. And then it starts to like get a little swimmy. I'm like, ah, oh, interesting. And and every rolfer has felt that sort of swimmy feeling. I'm like, what is that swimmy feeling? 
I've decided for my story that that swimming feeling is me literally taking a ride on their perifascial membrane. Mm. In other words, instead of being in that pinned state, after a while, I'm in gravity, right? And I can only hold a position for so long, one soft tissue form leaning onto another soft tissue form. And what's going to start to happen is as I adjust my own self in gravity and their body is adjusting in gravity, I'm going to start to shear on the plane of the perifascia over the deep fascia. I'm going to start mm -hmm. to... To, and and the tissue isn't offended by this. It actually kind of likes it, you know, to have to have um, some pressure, which is kind of like pressure on a sponge. You put pressure on a sponge and the fluid kind of goes out and then you take the pressure off the sponge and and the capillaries are like, wow, I don't have an elephant standing on me at the moment. Uh, and to them, an elephant is that elbow. Um or those fingertips or, or what have you. And then there's a there's a, a flushing or a rehydration of the tissue. That's a story, but I, mm -hmm. I like the story. And at the very least I've induced, I think I have induced possibly the thixotropic effect, not in the deep fascia, but in the perifascia. Mm -hmm. And if I'm leaning on somebody and, and that's uh, say, say I'm gone through superficial fascia, I'm, I'm connecting the deep fascia through the perifascia and I start to have that swimmy feeling then I'm I'm just I'm talking to that tissue and that tissue is listening and that tissue is thinking is this how I want to live the rest of my life maybe I want to do things differently <laughs> you know I've been I've been held up to the wall and now right. and now I'm like ah life mm -hmm. I can breathe again and I'm I'm gonna mm -hmm. I'm gonna try and do something differently now if I call for movement when I'm in that position which is another common technique that folks use mm -hmm. which I think is a really good one actually mm -hmm. you kind of got a blade of your arm on on the person's tissue and you say okay now whatever you're on their thigh and you say, you know, do this with your knee or your ankle or wherever you mm -hmm. are on their body. And you, and you ask for movement, maybe in a plane of motion that could use a little bit of work. Um, then you're going to have differential movement underneath the deep fascia because you're asking, mm -hmm. you're calling for the muscle tissue to move relative to the deep fascia, perifascia combination that you're pinning. And then you're going to create differential movement there. So there's, so you can use the same, leaning technique and call for movement or don't call for movement and and reach above the deep fascia or below the deep fascia and facilitate differential movement there facilitate the kind of um uh, refreshing of the perifascial plane and and basically calling having that tissue now call for water because you just leaned on it right and and dried it out a bit more and then mm -hmm. had some had movement and now that now the body's like dang grease this wheel because yeah thirsty uh, yeah because I'm, you know, I'm thirsty you're making me so thirsty and and it will take it from somewhere else if there's no water mm -hmm. in the system but mm -hmm. at, at least it'll it'll wake that area up mm -hmm. and then maybe we'll have flow through that area mm -hmm. on a regular on the regular instead of just at that moment Mm -hmm. And and something that comes up for me that I've been thinking about recently in my work, because a lot of my work is just like warming and soothing and then slowly sinking into tender, the most tender places in people's bodies, you know, working with their breath and their nervous system, mm -hmm. bringing some movement into it and, and under having this understanding that, um, you know, like, um, that steady compression, deep steady compression doesn't even have to be deep, but steady compression on their, on the body is very soothing to the nervous system. And so holding anywhere that we're going to hold steady for a while, the, the muscles themselves, the whole nervous system is going to kind of soften a little bit, hopefully. Right. Um, that, that, and I wonder just how much of a piece of the puzzle that is as well. Like the muscles are going to give of up some yeah. of their, mm -hmm, Super. some of their contraction. Oh, that's right on, right on target. Mm -hmm. I, I would say uh, that, that, that nervous system component is, is massive and that's how we can get very fast changes. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. we're addressing a tissue where autonomic nervous system lives. Yeah. And, and we're yeah. and we're called so there, there's the me, you know mechanical grunt level uh machine level of it and and then mm -hmm. there's the the um 
the nervous system component is, is massive. It's I mean, the most important. That's why you can yeah. get a body work change by talking to somebody, which is what I ended up doing as a rolfer. I was like, man, this rolfing stuff is tiring. I'm just going to talk to people and see what happens. <laughs> And I was like, wow, that's that's easier. And I was like, well, if I could do that with one person, I could do it with 30 people so, or 100. So why am I why am I in this practice? And I quit. <laughs> so I was like, if we can, this, you can really achieve massive yeah. autonomic nervous system changes just by talking to somebody the right way. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And if a person is holding, if we're body workers and a person is holding or the same, if they're on a ball or on one of those, I call them the foam roller of dooms, they have like nubs all over them and they're hard, you know, and they're going, oh, 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 you know, you're just working against yourself. It doesn't make any sense. You know, I always ask my students, like, what does deep work even mean? Like, what are you doing? What is your intention? Um, why would you dig as deep as you can and push stuff like you just might be causing some damage, actually? you know it's certainly the person is not relaxing <laughs> when they're doing that so they're just increasing tension right increasing yeah. that response yeah deep work can be um you know settling into a connection enough that you can say i love you and mean mm -hmm. it and the person is settled in enough to actually believe it and receive it mm -hmm. and and then their heart opens up and and their whole body is changed so mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a, no a novelty roller isn't saying I love you to your tissue. No. <laughs> it's like back I to that it. mentality of like, get oh, out, it. get out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I would love to um, to shift gears just a little bit and ask you just a little bit about scar tissue. And I want to okay. understand, I'd love to, um, I have a few questions about scar tissue and um, the changes that we've seen in injury rehabilitation, now they're not casting with a rigid cast anymore. People are encouraged to do some non-weight bearing movement. And I'd like to understand how movement during that healing process and the laying down of scar tissue affects the way scar tissue is laid. Because I, I always encourage my people to move as much as they can without extraordinary pain when they are healing. Um, and so um, what does that movement do with how the scar tissue forms? And then also, why is scar tissue such a problem in our bodies? Like how, how far can scar tissues effects extend in the body? Ready, set, go. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll start with the caveat that I'm really not a scar tissue researcher at the physiological mm -hmm. level, but I, I can say I've been witness to thousands and thousands and thousands of inside views on mm -hmm. scars mm -hmm. uh, and from from reading those tea leaves i have thoughts about scar tissue mm -hmm. uh, and there are people who i highly recommend sharon wheeler who's a rolfer uh, of many uh, 40 years experience and uh who is a, a real expert on changing scar tissue as well as my friend uh Alice, Alistair McLuff, McLaughlin, Alice, Alistair <laughs> McLaughlin, uh, um, who has also 40 years of experience working with scar tissue. So these two, these are two marvelous uh, practitioner teachers uh, who are masters with scar tissue. So I'm just putting that out there. Thank you. Um, so I always start any conversation about scar mm -hmm. tissue by saying, thank God for scar tissue. Scar tissue represents our body's capacity to recover from injury. And apart from our, our scar tissue forming capacity, we'd be dead a lot earlier and wouldn't last as long on the planet. So thank goodness for scar tissue. And what scar tissue, and, and that same principle that results in our tissues getting glommy and agglom agglomerated from stasis, dehydration, and inflammation is the same thing that's happening with scar tissue, but that's where it's supposed to be happening. Mm. In other words, and I like to say that we're all like mm. sharks. <laughs> we mm. are a species that has to keep moving or we'll turn into a block of wood, basically. We'll get, we will get stuck and agglomerated so we keep moving and 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 that movement principle is so that our inside doctor our capacity to form scars is is kept 
busy. You know what they say about an army that isn't busy? You know, they it, and the Romans knew this well. If you didn't keep them busy building an aqueduct or something, they'd all fight. They did <laughs> self-destroy themselves. And so we're kind of like that. We have this doctor inside of us whose job is to stitch things together. And if 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 we're if we don't keep them moving, then we'll get bored and start stitching things together. But if we're injured, he's right on the job and we'll stitch things together. And that's what a scar is. So the, the story mm. is all continuous. It's not a different story. Mm. It's all the same story. It's the story of our capacity to stick one thing to another in our body. The question is, since that's an inherent capacity that never goes away, how do we assure it's, ma it's maximally appropriate? Um, so when we're injured, you don't want to move so much that your scar keeps breaking open. Right. If you've had a surgery, you don't want to move in such a way that that's you're going to bust open your stitches. Right. That's not good at all. You got to give your body some time to heal. But so you don't have to worry that you're going to be like in a maze of scar tissue up through every inch of your body because you're healing a scar in your abdomen that you had surgery on. You want to make space for that healing to happen. And that healing is the formation of a scar. And a scar in a bone, for instance, will be the sturdiest part of that bone. I've seen broken bones that have been healed over time inside of people's bodies. And man, that's sturdy, right? So there's, there's, a, there's a value in that sturdy recovery. And uh, after the fact, then you can talk to those tissues and and call upon the blood supply to return there you can call upon differential movement to return there without having a scar go away you don't want the scar to go away the right. scar is good we have to get mm -hmm. that in our heads scars are good mm -hmm. uh and then the question though is if once we know the scar is good and we're not afraid to go to it and talk to it, make friends with it and fall in love with it because it's such a wonderful servant of our bodies of keeping us alive, then, you know, if, if we have a different disposition towards scars are bad and, and it's a nasty part of my body and I had a traumatic event there and I'll never go there again, then you create, then you create a, a an area around the injury that will be prone to stillness dehydration, inflammation, and the formation mm -hmm. of more sticking tissue. So tissues will, will progress in their connections if we're not moving there. It's not the scar's fault that it's growing. Mm -hmm. It's it's your withdrawal of energy from the area that the scar is growing. You're telling it to grow. You know, and, and when we move and touch and relate to and connect with and bring our attention to the area then it's like oh i did my job and that's the end of that and everything else is going to stay slippery around here and life is good to go but i have seen progressive adhesions adhesions in people's bodies where literally their entire visceral cavity is a solid mass of organs i've seen that many times uh and and that's a withdrawal i would say and someone might be saying, oh, Gil, you're blaming the victim or whatever. I'm like, no, I'm I'm offering a chance to feel better is what I'm doing mm -hmm. uh, by by recognizing that we don't need to hide from, run away from, be afraid of, be angry at um, these places in our bodies that that uh, have have suffered. Look, little kid, you got to mm -hmm. pet it. You got to, you know, your kid falls down off of its bike, you know, beat him with a baseball bat. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You pick them up and hug them. So you, if you, if you, you know, so you pick it up. Now the timing of that hugging, you know, I I do believe that and know that the medical uh, world has realized. Oh, geez, we don't need to really make a person not move here for three months. months uh, look yeah. for them to heal. I did when I broke my leg as a kid. I, I was three months in a cast. You know, uh, it was this weird other being that came out of that cast it was like right. so gross it was so gross All shrunken up and atrophied and shrunken, right. atrophied and hairy like an ape <laughs> and, and dirty like it was like oh my god that's where that 
using a pretzel rod to scratch your, you know, and then you lose it. Oh, and yeah. it's like two months, two months. I mean, it was so gross in there. You can't believe it. And then amazingly, what was amazing was how quickly, how quickly, you know, as a 13 year old, my leg, mm. you know, recovered, recovered. and you know, a normal matching leg again. But uh, so we don't, I don't think we need to be waiting so long, but a couple of weeks and enough for your, your tissues to knit together and for those stitches to do their job. That's really important. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to get cocky and, and, you know, cause you'll, you'll just be back and have to be stitched up again. Right. Uh, yeah. So, so that's, that's a little bit about that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. I think it's important. It's important for people to understand because I, I feel so much of the work that I do is just is helping people to understand more about their body so they don't feel like they're victims of their bodies. I find a lot of, there's this idea that I'm a, I'm a victim of my body. I have an injury. And so, Oh, you know, and then they move a little and it feels a little sore hurts a little. And they're like, Oh, I'm never going to move again <laughs> like that, you know? And then yeah. um, I think there's just a, there's just not enough education around how our bodies actually work and that, yeah, it's okay. You tweak your back a little bit, just do a little movement build up and it'll, it'll be fine. You know, like 90 some yeah. percent of the time it's fine. It's not a structural. We tend to, I think the, the medicalized version of our bodies is that there's a structural damage or something tore terribly and you're probably never going to be okay again, you know? And so that's part of my mission is to, that's a curse. <laughs> that's a, yeah. That's literally curse yeah there's a lot of cursing going on uh we curse right. our bodies that way right and yeah. uh and and take in curses of others like and it's um got to be really careful yeah. how we talk to them yeah uh, bodies you know our subconscious will will program our body according to our mind and mm -hmm. if our mind totally. is continually cursing our bodies expect to live in a cursed form uh right. it's created you know you've created it exactly exactly good news is you can also uncreate it because it's a very compliant yeah. it's a very compliant beast uh our mm -hmm. bodies and and they're more than happy to delight you yes uh, the body the body is an incredible playground of delights uh mm -hmm. as, and and um and and higher states of capacity than we even dare to imagine in our drudger drudging drudging around in the in the um in the lowest perception of our form that that is cultivated there mm -hmm. or um, even thinking are, about it at all or even thinking about it at all not even on the yeah. radar not i mean but there the are radar. superpowers inherent in our in our form in our consciousness and and we we just don't try it mm -hmm. uh but we can we can mm -hmm. want to try it <laughs> Yeah, that that is a whole other interview. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole other conversation. Um, I really appreciate so much your your time with me here today. And I want to ask if there is, if there's, I think I already know what you're gonna say, but if there's one piece piece of advice that you could give to people living in this magnificent human form. Um to live well in their bodies, what is the one thing that you would say? Blessing and gratitude every day mm. for your, for your gift, for the gift, thanksgiving for the gift, blessing mm. and thanksgiving for the gift. Because if we, if we do that, <laughs> then you are literally raising the vibration of the whole complex of the human person with blessings and thanksgivings. Like, thank you. My gosh, I didn't. I didn't, I didn't even know what I'm walking around with. I have an mm. incredible, incredible gift here. And here I've been complaining about this thing or that thing when, when 99, 44, 100% percent of it is working at a, at a level of super conscious brilliance right. that you haven't even, that you haven't ever acknowledged. And you're, you're like living in a, in a, in a, in a, the legions of angels and you're in the midst of that going, you know, so <laughs> try blessing and, and mm -hmm. grateful for it rather than complaining about it and, and see what happens for mm -hmm. you. 
I love that. I love that so much. I actually begin every one of my sessions with my clients where we take some deep breaths and I'm like, thank you, body. Say thank you. Wish it well. Send loving kindness through your body. Like, wow. Amazing. (laughs) Great. Well, thank you so much. Everybody can find Gil at gilheadley.com. I highly recommend if you're a body worker um, or just someone who's so fascinated about this incredible human form that we have, that you become a member of a site. It's crazy affordable so easy and the the videos are magnificent so gilheadley.com more, more to come more to come always I, more to I come am, yeah i am i keep on doing stuff yes you do yeah great well thank okay. you so much gil thanks yeah. cats